while you're not um, speaking, if you have the ability to talk on mic, I'd ask you just to have that muted so that we don't have any uh, background distraction noise. You will see somebody named uh, Steve Slowinski is has joined us. He is our tech support. And using the chat feature, you are able to private message him if you run into any uh, technology challenges throughout this uh, throughout this uh, webinar. You will notice that I will be uh, using slides for the visual. And then for those of you who are unable or uh, have yourself on mute uh, or unable to use your microphone, please feel free to ask questions in the chat feature and I'll try to go back and forth and and answer your questions and then we'll have a chance for questions at the end as well and Steve who I just <laughs> who I just uh, introduced says he waves to all that's what he wrote in his uh, in his chat so everybody wave back to Steve all right so this is gonna be a really fun webinar uh, and we're gonna talk about a project that was a collaborative project between a number of partners, and we'll talk about the partners in a moment, but we're gonna talk about this, uh, this project and how peer mentoring was used to empower young adults with disabilities to become transportation advocates in their community. And uh, it was the first time we at PYD, you'll hear me refer to part Partners for Youth with Disabilities as PYD um, had taken part in something uh, of this nature with transportation advocacy. So we learned a lot and we're excited to share. So the agenda, we're going to last one hour today. And in the agenda, we're going to uh, get a description of the initiative and understanding why it's important. We're going to talk about the keys to success why we think this initiative was successful and it, the proactive things that we did up front to uh, lead to success. We're going to hear from two uh, wonderful advocates in Massachusetts. Uh, and we're also going to hear from uh, the peer mentors who are also advocates in Michigan. We're going to learn about the importance of training peer mentors and making sure that they're ready for the responsibility of mentorship. And then we'll share some resources and I'll share some next steps, what's happening next in the evolution of this. And then we'll have time for questions. So the first section, uh, we're going to talk about project-based Six, and I have the distinct honor of uh, having Judy Shanley, who will be uh, going over the next two slides. Judy is the Assistant Vice President of Education and Youth Transition at Easter Seals uh, Incorporated, where she supports affiliates to implement evidence-based transition practices in response to legislative requirements. She has many years of experience and a whole host of um, accolades under her belt. Um, and she has experience in a number of fields, transportation being one of them. She is the president elect of the National Division on Career Development and Transition. And prior to working at Easter Seals, she worked at the US Department of Education, the Office of Special Education, and Office of Post Secondary Education and worked on, had a key role in implementing the provisions of the Higher Education Opportunity Act to facilitate the ability of students with intellectual disabilities to attend college and secure financial aid. Uh, she earned her PhD in special education from the University of Florida and an MBA and master's in rehabilitation counseling both from Syracuse University. So I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed uh, presenter, Dr. Shanley, to talk to you about Project Basics and why this is important. Judy. Thank you, Janelle. I am thrilled to be here to talk about this work. I'm thrilled that we have so many of the youth part of the discussion here to share with you their experiences in going through the project. I just wanted to give you a basic understanding of what this was all about. We know that there's 
literature associated with the importance of mentoring for youth, mentoring to facilitate access to employment, access to community living. We also have evidence that suggests when students with disabilities during their transition from high school to post high school have mentoring or are supported by mentoring, that that facilitates post-school outcomes to a higher degree. So we wanted to learn what were the conditions under which we could implement a transportation mentoring program where we paired um, students who had um, very much experience in transportation advocacy and understanding transportation options with students who didn't have that experience. So it was a demonstration project for a limited period of time that sought to really understand what are the components of a mentoring program. As part of that, and you'll hear from the students, we had many interactive mentoring and educational sessions where students were encouraged to engage in their own mentoring initiatives. This project, the funding for this project came from the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Community Living. Easter Seals was a subcontractor to the Community Transportation Association of America. And the overall project sought to understand how do individuals with disabilities and older adults, how can those individuals be more engaged and interactive in transportation planning? And we had partners on the project that included the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. We had an evaluator, DB Consulting, and it was an amazing pro project. And we were so, Easter Seal was so glad to be able to have the resources to partner with um, partners for youth with disabilities to particularly focus on transportation as it relates to youth with disabilities and transition. Um, so why is this important? You know, it may it may seem pretty obvious to, to folks that, um, you know, transportation as it relates to success after high school is a critical component of that success. But often, educators, families, and youth themselves don't think about inclusive mobility options. I remember working with a school district and working with transition coordinators, and transition coordinators felt like, they were doing an amazing job helping students fill in a paratransit eligibility um, document. And that's at that time, that's what the students thought was their only mobility option. And so a project like this and engaging youth in the process of transportation decision making helps them think about the many inclusive mobility options that may be available. So too does it help transit providers to appreciate and engage with youth with disabilities as they plan for service, as they decide upon mobility options in community. A project like this can really inform transportation providers. It also increases a range of accessible transportation options because youth are innovative, we're creative. They can offer and suggest transportation options that might be viable in their community. The other really neat outcome associated with this project was um, that individuals learned about careers in transportation and mobility management industries. We have a shortage of individuals with disabilities in the profession of mobility management and transportation. And a project like this highlights the opportunities that may be available in the future for those youth. So, it was, it was truly an exciting project. We felt very privileged to be working with PYD and, and the PEAK students as mentors. And we too learned a lot. And we hope to, Janelle will talk to you about some of the next steps, but we hope to package what we've learned so that it could be replicated nationally and by national organizations. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Janelle who will introduce our students and talk to you about the real heart of this work. Janelle? 
Thank you, Judy. Uh, it's great to have uh, your perspective and really the big picture of why we're doing this. I think you bring up a great point that we know mentoring works and we wanted to see how it could apply to this, this um, specific kind of advocacy, transportation advocacy. And so I'm going to talk to you about the project implementation. I served as the project uh, manager and so I really got to be involved in the nuts and bolts of it. And I was thrilled that uh, we were able to collaborate with PEAK, promoting education, uh, education for all cyclists in Michigan, because they had m many years of transportation advocacy under their belt. And their advocates, all advocates with disabilities, uh, served as peer mentors to our advocates in Massachusetts. So I'm going to talk through the, the basic steps of the program, because if you're thinking of, uh, of a program of this nature, these are the things that, that we did that uh, in terms of just the way uh, and the, the order that we did things. So we started by finding the right collaborators. Uh, so you already heard that Easter Seals served as a funder for the project, but they really served as so much more. Um, there was a lot of guidance and connecting us to people in the field to make sure we were uh, reaching out to the right people. We ended up selecting Peak as our collaborator uh, because they had experienced such success with transportation advocacy in Michigan, and they also uh, worked uh, fairly exclusively with youth with disabilities, many of them with intellectual disabilities. And we knew that they were having success in supporting uh, young adults with disabilities in becoming uh, their own transportation self-advocates, not only advocating for themselves personally, but advocating for others in their state. And we were very impressed by that. We then recruited advocates and we made the recruitment process for advocates a selective one. Uh, we had uh, people who wanted to apply, young adults with disabilities who wanted to participate. We asked them to do so via a selection process and we also used Youth Leadership Forum as the primary place where we recruited youth. And for those of you who don't know about Youth Leadership Forum, it's a it's nationwide. It happens uh, typically in each state and often funded by the state's uh, commission, like the uh, rehabilitation commissions. And the goal is to train up leaders in the disability community. Uh, young leaders to become better advocates. And so we use that as our recruitment vehicle because we wanted to be sure we were choosing youth who already had a basic skill level in terms of their um, soft skills and in terms of um, just being prepared for what they were going to undertake. So we, from our applicants, we selected seven uh, seven advocates from across the state of Massachusetts. They were all young adults with a, a wide range of disabilities, both hidden and apparent disabilities. And we chose uh, advocates from both urban and rural settings and advocates from a wide range of backgrounds, uh, racial and ethnic and uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. So we had a, a, a diversity, which was very critical to the success of the project. We uh, worked with the peer mentors in Michigan to train them. I probably should have said at the beginning that Partners for Youth with Disabilities has been providing mentoring opportunities to youth with disabilities and young adults with disabilities for 32 years and so has a, a strong history in um, training mentors. And so we used that experience and intellectual property to be able to tr train and support the mentors in, uh, in Michigan before they ever connected with the mentees. 
We then uh, use technology, as so many projects are able to do now, to introduce the, the peer mentors in Michigan to the advocates in Massachusetts via an accessible uh, accessible uh, web platform. And we started having learning sessions and we had get to know, the first session was really a get to know each other and build trust. And then after that, we had a series of six sessions that were led almost entirely by the advocates in Michigan. They identified uh, along with our involvement, the key transportation topics that they wanted uh, they wanted to um, share with the uh, Massachusetts advocates and they were things like understanding different modes of transportation, identifying barriers to transportation, uh, using your self-advocacy skills, some basic concepts but really fundamental to the um, to understanding and being a, a strong and empowered advocate. And then after that, the after we went through a series of sessions, the Massachusetts advocates chose an advocacy project uh, based on uh, transportation barriers that they identified in their community. And you'll hear more about that directly from the advocates in a moment. And um, after we conducted the advocacy project and received feedback from the peer mentors, we had a closure session. And I, I think that's really something that's often missed. Uh, I come primarily from a counseling background in my younger years. That was my education and my background. And uh, realizing doing a project like this, there were a lot of um, bonds that were developed both uh, within the advocates from Massachusetts, but also across state lines. There was a lot of fondness that developed. And so we took time and we took a session to close out and make sure we said proper goodbyes and then identify the ways in which we would keep in touch. And uh, that's important for um, just, you know, emotional social emotional growth to go through that process. And then we conducted the evaluation, which consisted of a pre and post test, which measured um, knowledge, uh, opportunity, and skills. And I can talk more about that uh, later, but we did find some definite improvements in the significant improvements in the area of knowledge, significant improvements in the area of confidence and opportunity. The only piece that didn't improve a lot is transportation as a career option. We asked the question, would you consider transportation as a career option? And primarily it's because those, we had several advocates who scored high on that to begin with. And so it skewed the data a little bit, but um, but we did see some excellent uh, outcomes as a result of this of this uh, four month project. So, in my, I've been involved in uh, different human services projects for many years, over twenty years, and I often like to you know, we're really proactive. We try to think about what's going to make this project successful. But sometimes it's not until the end that you really go, wow, we now we know why this project was successful. And there were a number of things that I think created success. One was uh, we recruited a diverse group of young adults with prior leadership training and just can't say enough about that. We having diversity across disability, gender, all of the, the rural versus um, urban brought a variety of perspectives to the table. And those perspectives were key in identifying our, our need and then identifying the project. And it just led to a richness in conversation that otherwise wouldn't have been there. Also, I think the support of training for the peer advocates was really key in the success of our project. Um, 
making them feel empowered and helping them understand the expectations of a peer mentor. And you're going to hear much more about that uh, later on in the webinar. The third one is critical. It was a process driven by the advocates, both from the perspective of the Michigan peer mentoring advocates, identifying the topics, uh, doing all the presentations to the Massachusetts advocates, and also in Massachusetts, having the advocates be completely in charge of identifying the need and identifying the project that they would implement. It was not an a it was not a staff driven project. It was driven by the advocates and it gave them ownership. The other thing that's really important here is uh, we did offer a stipend for the Massachusetts advocates to participate, a, um, a monetary stipend. And that uh, I think added added something to the process because the advocates um, in Massachusetts treated this more like a job or an internship. They showed up on time, if not usually early. They were prepared. They did their homework. And I think also it was important for us to uh, validate and recognize the time and effort they were giving to this process. And so that stipend was an important piece of the success. And then also just clear and realistic metrics for evaluation. We knew we wouldn't change the world in four months. We knew uh, that advocacy is a series of baby steps. So we focused on things that we knew we could improve in that time and sort of plant the seed for the future. And so we focused on improving knowledge. We focused on improving opportunity, opportunity to practice advocacy, opportunity to practice all of those things we were learning. And then um, in turn, confidence, you know, do the young people feel more confident to be transportation advocates as a result of the project? So now you're going to hear from uh, two two advocates that I have the pleasure of getting to know as a result of this project. And um, they are Zomari Gonzalez and Austin Carr. And uh, these were two of our superstar advocates who were very engaged throughout the entire project. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to have a question and answer session. I'm going to interview them with the questions you see on the slide. And they're going to uh, share with us what they thought about their experience. So I'm going to make sure they both are off Thank mute. And I'm going to ask Austin to say hello. Hi, Janelle. Can you hear me? We can hear you just great, Austin. And how about Zumari? Yes, I'm here. OK, great, Zumari. So um, I'm going to start by asking them each a question, and we're going to move through the questions, and they'll both have a chance to answer both. So I'm going to start with Austin. Austin, why did you apply to be a transportation advocate? I, uh, I applied because it sounded cool and, and I wanted to learn more about transportation options and ways to improve transportation for me and how to best do it. I also wanted to learn more, more other people's experience were how they handled challenges because I had had many challenges and seeing the need for improvement, I wanted to be more confident and independent in getting with getting around and to and to learn to increase advocacy to make change. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate you sharing that. Excellent. How about you, Zomari? Why did you apply to be a transportation advocate? Um. I applied to be a transportation advocate because 
um, it seemed really interesting and you know being on the MBTA the Boston Transportation it was like sort of figuring out how to advocate for myself and for other people um, and then I learned others experiences and how uh, like we're all the same and trying to focus on one goal that's great. Thanks, Amari. And you live in uh, right in the city of Boston in Roxbury. Is that correct? Yes. So you have public transportation at every corner almost in Boston. And uh, Austin, you're more in the suburbs. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, so it's a little bit harder. Uh, you know, you're not don't have as many options for public transportation in the suburbs, but you still have the ability to um, to use public transportation. Sure. So, um, Zomari, what did you learn from the peer mentors in Michigan? Zomari, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. That's okay. What did you learn from the peer mentors in Michigan? Um, what I learned from the peer mentors were that we sort of have the similar like struggles when it comes to transportation. A lot of it um, could be like that they're not as accessible um, and that we're all like trying to be, try to be more, um, Trying to get, trying to be uh, uh, more helpful and try to make it more accessible. Um, I think I also learned too is like that, um, that we're all focusing on one goal and trying to make sure that we have the goal and make it possible to make some of the changes that we want to make. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. How about Austin? What did you learn from the peer mentors in Michigan? Uh, so what I, I learned so much from the group every week, they gave a really good presentation that went into great detail about about different modes of transportation and different barriers to transportation and personal stories about ch change and by advertising and uh, uh, also test testify the testifying process. That's great. I learned a lot from the peer mentors in Michigan too, and I, I know all the all the advocates in Massachusetts did. I really want to hear about your team's advocacy project. Zumari and Austin worked on that together with some of the other um, some of the other uh, advocates. The team actually split into two, some focusing on a project in Western Massachusetts because that's more rural. And uh, Zumari and Austin both helped focus on uh, a project in Boston. And I'm going to let Z uh, Austin go first and talk about that and then let Zumari add in what she wants to say. So Austin, tell us a little bit about your team's advocacy project. The the project that we decided on was to redress the the tap card be available in more locations than just one. The tap card is a reduced fare card for people with disabilities. And seniors. We wrote a letter about the problem and sent a letter to the MBTA general, general manager of accessibility. That we explained our group's problem 
that the the Charlie Todd was available in many locations, but the Tab Todd was only available at one. Identify some solutions about how to make it more more the tab time more more accessible to them. We heard we were excited to hear back so gently and that they were working on the problem to you know. Thank you, Austin. So yes, the team identified that the reduced fare card for people with disabilities was only available by going downtown to one location and applying there. There was no online ability or mail in ability. And as we know, there are you know lots of barriers to transportation for people with disabilities. Um, and so the thought that it you know you would have to dr go an hour or two hours to and do many bus transfers or public transportation transfers just to do this didn't make sense to our group and so they wrote a letter and i'll tell you more later but we heard some results back and it was real positive before i share that zomari what do you have to add about the project is there anything that austin uh that that you'd like to share based on what austin has already shared um, pretty much what Austin shared was everything that we worked on, but um, I think like we were just trying really hard to make it at different locations because it wasn't fair for a lot of people who were outside of Boston that couldn't go and pick up an application or even the card when they got accepted. So, I mean, hopefully we, we try to get it to the point where the MBTA knows that, you know, we share our experience and that they'll take it into consideration that, you know, to have more places available. Very good. Well, the team decided that they wanted to do both a written letter that Zumari actually hand delivered to the office and they wanted to do an electronic version via email. So they did that and everybody signed their name to the letter. And I'm really pleased to report that they heard back right away from the MBTA. And honestly, I, I was shocked at the promptness of their response. And what they said was that they knew that it was an issue and they were working on solutions and in the meantime, that any of the uh, advocates could have a mail-in option until the permanent solution was found. And so having that tangible <laughs> acknowledgement from the transit provider that yes, it was an issue, that they were working on it and that they wanted to work with this group of advocates to, to make solutions was, just the most positive thing I could imagine happening as a result of this. So Austin, um, now that we've been done with the project for a number of months, looking back, what did you learn from participating? I, I, I learned that making change and advertising is a process. And I learned about the process and the many sets it takes. I learned that change takes time, that you need to be involved, that personal stories are very powerful. Don't work in a group is helpful and don't give up. I also learned how to be a better advocate to make people more confident and, and also to keep educating myself and others and others. Thank you. It does sound like you learned a lot, Austin. How about Zulmari? What did you learn as a result of the project? Um, I learned that it doesn't stop from what we did. Like, 
those few months and that um, we just have to keep going when it comes to advocacy, um, not just in transportation, but in a lot of things. Um, and just keep pushing yourself and to make sure that you're heard so that nobody, um, so that nobody put, like says that you didn't try or like say that you wasn't advocating for yourself. Thank you. That is true. What we learned was just the beginning and now it's time to take those skills and and move forward with them. So I think what you're saying has is very true. So Austin, how were you using the skills you learned? Because of this room, I wanted to explore and see just how just how to get my tap time. It was a little challenging. I needed support, but I got my tap time. I think doing this helped me, me when we worked on a project. And I am involved in a, in a town self advocacy group called Windsor Throne. I have been sharing what I learned with that group. I, I feel more prepared after being part, part of this transportation group. And I, I am using the ride and independently and I'm using Uber with, with support. Starting, I am starting a uh, travel train to help me with the trains. Um, and, th and then I have one more line. This, this wasn't to do with, have to do with transportation, but a few, a few weeks ago, I went to youth, youth mentoring day, and we told our powerful stories about mentoring at the at the state house to try and make build build and to bring more awareness around mentoring. That's so impressive, Austin. So you've taken what you've learned, you've not only applied it to your own life and the way you get around, uh, because I know when we first met, you were really relying on your parents a lot for transportation and now you're using the ride, you're using Uber. And in addition to that, you're advocating at the state house for the things you believe in. So uh, that's very impressive. Uh, how about you, Zulmari? What have, um, tell me how you've been using your skills. Um, well, I've been using my skills um, a lot lately, um, but I recently got, in, got a bill into the state house um, so I got accepted to the state, um, and it's the, it's called the Healthy, the Healthy Youth Act, I think. Um, it's just basically, like, about making sex ed, um, more inclusive in schools, and I, what, what we have put together on the paper for, uh, for the transportation advocacy, I use that as a model to sort of like um, write down what I wanted to say in a way to make sure that the bill got passed. Um, but the bill did get passed, but not, it's still like in the state, they're still trying to figure it out. So hopefully it gets passed by the other head people to make sure that um, sex education gets inclusive in schools. 
Thank you, Zamari. That's impressive too. I have two, I think, future politicians in front of us or two lifelong advocates who are taking what they've learned and, and taking it to the state. I want to thank you both uh, for participating. It was uh, and anybody who, uh, can somebody put yourself on mute, please? Thank you. Uh, so, oh, there you go. So I want to thank you both for participating. Uh, you really gave it your all during the during the sessions and during the project. And I thank you for sharing your experience with us here today. Next, we're going to hear from PEAK, Programs to Educate All Cyclists. Originally, I think we were going to hear from a peer, uh, a peer advocate, but I think the advocate uh, got called into work, so he's unable to share his perspective. But I believe we have John here, and John is the executive director of PEAK, Programs to Educate All Cyclists, and their organization was in charge of prepping the peer mentors to uh, uh, train and teach and support our Massachusetts advocates. John, would you like to take a few a few minutes and just share your experience? I definitely would like to take a few minutes to share our experience. Um, again, James is sorry. We uh, just got back from D.C. Uh, a, a few hours ago, and he had to get into work. He was late getting into work, so his, his shift was going to be extended, so he didn't miss his time. Uh, so advocating sometimes does get in the way of, uh, of, of life and trying to make sure we, he meets his responsibilities. So James is really sorry he cannot speak to you regarding this issue. Um, before I continue, I'd like to congratulate Zamari about her legislation and in that piece of legislation being introduced. That is a great first step and that's the best we can hope for out of this group where you take your skills and you use them where you feel is the most important. Um, it sounds like you passed the house and the Senate and the uh, and, and the, the games are gonna begin. So there's a lot to do with it. Anytime you need peak to help, we definitely would be a sounding board for your process. Um, our experience for being a transportation advocate. When we first started off with this project, our students were very capable of going through the testimony. They knew how to uh, provide testimony. They knew how to tell their story. They knew how to uh, discuss what issues they wanted to uh, work on and then put that into a, uh, a formal presentation. So our students really did not write letters, did not do that. Most of the students faced a cognitive impairment, so reading and writing was very tough for them. But being able to tell their story straight up was a very um, engaging for both uh, uh, political leaders and the students themselves. Uh, and so coming with that experience and being that transportation advocate, our students have testified in front of the House, in front of the Senate, in front of uh, signed legislations with the governor. Um, they've uh, testified in front of the um, uh, Road Commission, uh, Simcog. Uh, they've gone to individual meetings about street signs and changing things. They've been, uh, they've been told no, and they've realized how to accept no and yes, and how to keep on pushing for the levels and understanding no is many times a temporary roadblock and that if all we hear is yeses, we're never asking for enough. Um, so their experience is pretty vast and everyone had a, a role in that. Uh, what, what they learned, learned by being peer mentors and advocates with Massachusetts, uh, it really is, you may be able to do stuff really well and understand some skill sets, but when you have to teach it, work and mentor it, your skills become much more refined and weaknesses in your skills also show. So for our students, it was an hourly paid rate, um, which ended up having some issues with some of the students' um, uh, financial support they're receiving. And uh, one student did uh, stop his payments as a paid employee and became a volunteer for the project uh, because of some of the challenges he was facing regarding the home he lived in and what he was doing. Um, so. Part of it was also the employment aspect. Uh, it was uh, an eye-opening for us as an agency and an eye-opening for the individuals trying to get into the job market uh, and use this as a position. Uh, the next piece is that learning. Um, when we teach, we learn. And um, our students that were presenting 
worked so hard. And the two weeks between the thing just didn't seem like enough time for them to prep their lessons because it was the first time they're really doing lessons and sharing ideas to individuals. Um, when they were accepting modes of travel and accepting what they're going to do for their presentation and share their stories, they took it too hard and they worked very, very um, hard on it. Um, I think they were they were shocked by the amount of work it took to produce the, these presentations and the work. Um, looking at other things they learned, I think they learned that uh, Massachusetts may ha have a great system for travel and our students were very envious of all the options they had for traveling. Um, but hearing that there's some of the same types of problems of how do you get in the system, how do you get a reduced fare card, um, you know, why isn't there a universal uh, application? Why isn't there, you know, easier access? Uh, those seem to be across the transit through the United States. And our students were, um, uh, you know, realized that, wow, this is a bigger issue. And each change we make will help make changes in other states. Uh, they also learned they weren't alone. Uh, that uh, many times our students go there and they never see in other individuals' disabilities advocating it's only themselves and they're kind of that peak group uh, so they're very excited to meet others um, the six months my students felt a little, they wanted more time they wanted more time to get the projects done they wanted more time to really see a project through and begin a battle um, I think no matter how long you made the time until they accomplished their feet I think my students still would have wanted to go further and to, and to go you know farther um, the most challenging part about being a peer mentor was the responsibility uh, even though you're not responsible for people making changes or doing things that responsibility to make sure they're embarking that knowledge and that they're giving people the tool they need to be independent uh, was a um, was a real challenge and talking about what they wanted to share uh, also, a big part of the challenge was to be asking questions. Um, that was something we had to work a lot on. Um, our students are really good at telling their stories, but pulling other people's stories out um, was really challenging. And Janelle, your examples of how you did things, we were able to talk to our students afterwards and said, do you remember when Janelle did this? Do you remember when Janelle you know, talked about that? And our students looking at the webinar and seeing who hasn't responded lately? What hasn't ha happened? And, and right near the end, they really started getting it. And we had some techniques such as, you know, if a staff member, somebody noticed somebody hasn't, we kind of point at somebody's name and then one of our students would ask a question pertaining that. Um, making sure the questions were directed to the individual, their need, and helping them acquire skills, uh, was a challenge right up to the end. Uh, a lot of our students would ask questions they knew the answer to or ask questions they didn't know the answer to and would just were kind of searching for the answers to, which is a normal part of education where if we don't know something, let's work on it, let's figure things out. I think that was something that our students uh, hadn't experienced much because we we have our experts working with them, helping them find stuff, and they kind of looked for us for the answers when they had questions. Uh, when questions came up here, it was right away turned over to the advocates saying, hey, do some research, find the answer. Um, and that was pretty liberating where um, many of the individuals in Massachusetts had uh, much higher academic skills and were able to do the research that um, some of our students found very difficult and very challenging. And so they were really excited about um, what the work the people in Massachusetts did. Um, the final advice for others who want to be a transportation advocate, um, our students, and I, I don't know if this worked with the Boston group, our students really are get connected, become an advocate, don't go on your own, get in a group and learn how to be an advocate, and then you can go on your own to do that. that you know, standing on the street corner, yelling and screaming and wanting things changed doesn't really uh, provide a lot of change. But getting engaged in a uh, activity that does advocacy and learning the techniques and the skills is by far stronger 
than identifying issues and just screaming about issues. Um, our students just as um, uh, with Boston, I think we'll transition these skills to other areas. Uh, we are really excited about what happens and we're in, are interested in trying to uh, pursue this with other groups. Uh, is there any questions I didn't ask, answer? That, that's perfect, John. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective from what you saw your, um, the peer mentors experiencing in Michigan. They were a very impressive group of, of young people and our Massachusetts advocates learned a lot from them. So thank you so much. Next, um, we've already had a great group of presenters and um, panelists. Next, we're gonna hear, you heard me earlier when I talked about the keys to success talk about why it was important to train the peer mentors in Michigan before they started um, connecting with the Massachusetts advocates. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jake Demossi, who's going to take about six to seven minutes to talk about the uh, peer mentoring in general, why this was a useful tool to use, and then uh, how you prepare peer mentors. So Jake, take it away. Great, thanks Janelle. Um, and really, thank you to everyone who went before me. I, I'm so good to hear those testimonials from the advocates and also from John on the ground there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, uh, what the importance of peer mentoring is. Um, and then uh, my contact information will be shared. So any questions that you have on this, feel free to contact me. Um, so first, it's very important to start off basically and define what a peer mentor is. So it is someone who shares skills and provide guidance to someone close in age to themselves. And there's a lot of benefits opposed to traditional mentoring. So two peer mentors um, have been through very similar experience and have a better, uh, a better level of comfort relating to each other. Um, and this allows it to be a lot more informal. And as some of the people have said before me, um, excuse me, I guess there's a beep in the hall. Um, as people have said before me, it really becomes a more organic feeling relationship where people are really more apt to share those little things. Um, and you know, one of the men one of the benefits and things that we really look for in our mentoring program is expanding that social comfort and expanding their familiarity with others in many social situations. So peer mentoring really does achieve two huge goals for us, which one being they're gaining these skills and they're learning to be advocates, but also the added benefit is that they're able to feel comfortable and feel a part of a community of people. Um, and finally, they really do enjoy a more realistic and organic relationship, like I said, and it really takes the onus off of the program staff um, and puts it more on the actual advocates who are working on the ground. It gives them a greater sense of ownership and that ownership, that sense, really yields high results. So next slide, please. So as you can see here, um, I took some screenshots from our initial um, training that we did for the peer mentoring. They're a little bit small, so I'll go over them point by point. But the format is very similar to how we run traditional one-to-one -to -one mentoring trainings. Um, usually the demographics for the mentoring trainings that we run are about 18 to 34, I would say. Um, but here the age, the median age was more like 20. Um, so a sample in agenda should include an introduction, a time that um, the peer mentors, uh, if they don't know each other already, can partake in an icebreaker and feel more comfortable relating to each other. Um, a program overview, being extremely transparent, detailing what the ask is, um, an introduction to mentoring, telling them what they should expect and what uh, their, their actual responsibility is, um, the definition of their role in this peer mentoring program, and clear next steps. The clarity part is extremely important. If you just say, oh, I will get into contact with you in a week and we'll go from there, 
the mentors may lose that that uh, that forward motion that they got from the training and interacting with each other. So it's important to have clear tangential next steps that happen as soon as possible after the end of the training. Um, and finally, something that is really important is to have a huge emphasis, emphasis on communication skills. And the best way that I found to illustrate this is by utilizing scenarios and relatable ones. So things that, ha things that will happen most likely, um, what I tell my mentors when reading a scenario is replace this word with, with X, Y, Z, and that's the scenario you'll be entering in. So it's a good way to actually apply those uh, active communication skills, that active listening, and uh, lead to having peer mentors who are, are more engaged and can readily help their mentee with any dilemma uh, that they're facing. And finally, my recommendations to include in uh, any kind of peer mentor training um, and before and after. So recruitment and mentor onboarding. Um, it's really important and it sounds really silly to say, but it's really for, important to find mentors who are actually familiar with the transit system that you're going into. Um, have people who use it every day, have a familiar uh, past history using it. Um, really, really important. Consulting with other stakeholders. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of buy-in to ideas like this, and it's likely that there is another agency or program that is already um, laying the groundwork. So talking to them and consulting to try to develop a, a strategy to implement your goals is really good and important. Um, fostering relationships between the peer mentoring is really, really important as well. Um, so let the mentors know that, yes, they have you as someone who could guide them, but you're not on the ground. So it's really important for those mentors, the individual mentors to relate to each other. Um, and we do this in a couple of different ways, but one of the best ways I've observed is our mentor community forums and our support network for mentors, which allows them to get together and them to interact with themselves um, in a more casual setting. Um, off of that, encouraging mentors to learn the best practices from each other. Like I had said, we're not on the ground every day. So yes, we have, a, we have an understanding of what's going on and what the goals of the program are, but we don't know exactly what the day-to-day uh, -day struggles that, that mentors are facing with their mentees are. Um, and lastly, it's really important to employ incentives heavily. Um, and at mentor trainings, the way that we do this, we always have uh, dinner for them. We have pizza or we have snacks. Um, and that's just a very easy and relatively low cost way to ensure that the mentors will be, uh, will be excited and driven to attend that training. Um, finally, after the, uh, after the training happens, supporting the matches is very important. Um, engaging the mentors and mentees in goal setting. We use the SMART framework, um, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, realistic, and time-specific. It's a good way to take a, a lofty goal and make it something more attainable, and it's also a good way to um, take that large goal and split it into smaller goals. Um, finding a neutral place for them to meet. Um, so a lot of peer mentoring programs employ virtual platforms as a way to um, achieve their goals and to unite people who are very far from each other. But uh, if, the, if the program so decides, um, finding a neutral place for them to meet is important. That means that it's not PYD's offices, it's a coffee shop down the street or somewhere on their territory where they're more comfortable. Um, Having matches schedule check-in times with program specialists. So having them have that onus on them um, to say, okay, I will call you on the second Monday of every month and we'll talk about what's happening. And then also knowing, uh, also letting them know that you're there as a resource as much as possible. And finally, when you're talking about um, planning match activities, um, a really good way uh, and a really relevant way to structure those is to talk to potential um, departments, highway departments, public work departments, transportation departments, um, to see if there are people who would be willing to host a job shadow, to see what they're doing, or even just present on the work of the department.
And finally, uh, Janelle put together the resources. These are all amazing resources that will provide uh, good support to any peer mentoring program. Um, again, I'm here to support you whenever you need. Um, and uh, thank you for letting me uh, talk to you guys. So thank you so much, Jake. Jake is a mentoring specialist at PYD and he's been in his role almost two years, I think. And uh, this is what he does every day is works with mentors and mentees to foster those strong relationships. So if you have additional questions for him, when we send out our um, follow-up email to all attendees, we'll include his, his information and I'm sure he'd be happy to share more tips. Uh, I want to, before we close out, I know it's three o'clock, but if you can bear with me for one or two more minutes, I want to acknowledge all of our partners, our funders, everybody who made this project possible. I want to share these resources because if you're considering using peer mentoring to uh, improve tr uh, transportation outcomes or really any advocacy outcomes, uh, these are some great uh, resources to, to check out. Next steps. So you will be receiving a follow-up email uh, for your attendance and you'll have a recording of these uh, slides. Feel free to share this recording with anybody that you think would be interested in this topic. There'll be an evaluation link. We really appreciate you filling that out and sharing with us what you thought of our time together today and what you learned. That's very helpful to help us improve and know what to continue. And lastly, I'm happy to uh, share that we're currently working on an implementation guide. So an actual guidebook that if you're interested in doing a project like this or something related to this around peer mentoring to improve transportation advocacy, that you'll have um, a, a guidebook and all of our training slides and copies of all of our work that we've done so that you too can uh, do something like this and you won't have to reinvent the wheel. We'll really be turning over the keys to the car, so to speak, uh, to help you do that. So <clears throat> I want to thank everybody, all of the presenters, uh, Judy, John, uh, Austin, Zumari, and Jake, and everybody who made this project possible. And thank you for you all for your attendance. I, I hope you uh, found it helpful and rewarding. Thanks a lot and have a great day. Have a great day, everyone.